Good evening and welcome to everybody who is watching us. What you see behind me is the library of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Forty years ago, three young philosophers, one Paul and two Germans, decided to start an academic institution that according to them was going to change the world for good. They believed that the Cold War was a temporary moment in European history, and as a result of it, they believed that they should basically start to thinking about the future of Europe and the future of the world beyond this Cold War divide. And now, 40 years later, we know that 3,000 scholars, translators, writers have been fellows in this institute, starting by these three individuals, which have been back then. And when Krzysztof Michalski, Cornelia Klinger, and Klaus Nellen started all this, the world was very different. It was just after the Solidarity Movement was crashed in Poland. But there was the intellectual ambition, the feeling that this is a time to think the, about the world differently. So when we started discussing how to celebrate the spirit of opening of the Institute, uh, we decided that the best thing that we can do is to organize a discussion about the past, about the future, about technology, between two, in my view, the most outstanding thinkers of the world today, and they're with us on the screen, Yuval Harari from Israel, and next to me, my colleague, uh, Timothy Snyder. My name is Ivan Krastev. I'm a permanent fellow in the Institute, like Tim. Tim uh, is also the professor in Yale, and uh, Mr. Harari is a professor in the Jerusalem University. And what I found particularly interesting having these two persons here is that both of them have been about the big picture. None of them stayed in a small kind of a discipline of certain academic research. And they have many things in common, but also two different perspectives. If I'm trying to summarize, uh, Professor Harari really is an expert on infinity. So I'm always believing that uh, he could be suspected to be an alien who was sent on Earth to monitor, basically, the development of the Humanity Project, <laughs> because he started from before man and ended after man. And Timothy Snyder is always very much interested in the world, but he has two points of departure which were much more concrete. One is Europe. And he started from Eastern Europe and on the base of the experience of Eastern Europe was trying to see the world in the way it is and probably in the way it should not be. And secondly, he started from 20th century and for him basically 20th century was the century with the unlearned lessons. So this is why having two of you, both of them historians of the past and historians of the future, I, I found particularly interesting because also both of you wrote the books with lessons. And listen, these days people are not kind of brave enough <laughs> to, to give lessons and to take lessons. So I want to start with my first question, and I hope that uh, my presence is not going to be very much visible in this debate, because the best debate is when the moderator is not present. And this is about Ukraine, and there are two reasons for this. First, the first time you have been on a panel together, I was told by Timothy Snyder was in virtual Kiev, and it was about the war in Ukraine. But secondly, my question is not what is happening on the ground. It is not the question how it ended up there. My question is, if in 40 years there are going to be a debate like this, and people are going to look back, how important this war was going to be? What is ending? Is anything starting? I can imagine many times when people are discussing certain events as critically important, and suddenly with the change of the perspective, it does not look exactly like this. And Tim, I want to start with you, because much more before Ukraine became the problem for everybody, it was your problem. He always believed that the fate of Ukraine is really critically important to understand both the past and the future of Europe. So if you're looking back from the year 2062, how the war in Ukraine was going to look like? Okay. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Yvonne, for the, for for the, for being here with us. You've all thanks for thanks for joining us as as our as our guest here. Um, as Yvonne said, I've been associated with this place with the the IVOM, the Institute for Human Sciences, for a long time since 1996, and it has helped me to become the historian of Ukraine and of other things that I became. As it's helped the other 
2,999 fellows um, to become the scholars that they have been. And it's been a wonderful part of this institute's tradition that it has focused on the voices that haven't necessarily been heard. So the premise when this institution was founded was that there were ideas in Eastern Europe which might end up carrying the day, which might end up being important. And as our work has spread out in other directions, further east or towards Russia, towards Ukraine, towards Turkey, that remains the premise, that there might be, pl there might be arguments coming from unexpected places which might end up carrying the day. And the people who started this institute essentially humored me when I wanted to write about Ukraine and when I made claims about how Ukraine was so important. When I, when I wrote Bloodlands, I was here. Um, when I conceived of Black Earth, which is also about Ukraine largely, I was, I was here. So Yvonne, my first answer to your question is, it'll be more important than we think. And the reason why I'm confident about that is that history often overlooks the things that are so deep and dark and important, right? Sometimes it's the heaviest things that get overlooked. And if we look at the history of Ukraine, it's often not seen because it's so central. So like the founding myth in the Western tradition of democracy is the myth of Athens, where, in, you know, where the city chooses Athena over Poseidon. And when the city chooses Athena, um, some of you have heard this story before, but when the city chooses Athena, the idea is, okay, we'll have the olive oil, we'll have the olive trees, rather than angry Poseidon and his salt water and his trident. And that's an image of democracy, which is, sh which is shady trees and contemplation. It's all very nice. But then you ask yourself, how did ancient Athens actually exist if all they grew was olive trees? And the answer is, they exported their food from what's now southern Ukraine. Right? That's how. That's how they existed. If you look at the Age of Discovery, uh, when, the, when the Italians and the Dutch and the Portuguese and the Spanish and the British were breaking out into the broader world of what we call the Americas and Africa and Asia, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was supplying them with food. How did it do that? By ensurfing the population of Ukraine. And where was arguably the first anti-colonial or proto-national or even national movement at that same time in the 17th century in Ukraine? When we look at the 20th century, at both the Soviet project and the Nazi project, although historians and public discussions of this don't always notice it, in fact, usually don't, Ukraine is at the center of both the Soviet and the Nazi project for the transformation of the world. It's been so important to world history that we have had trouble seeing it. You know, there's this irony. We think that the things we see are what's important, but often it's the other way around. Often what we see is what's easy to see and what's important is what gets overlooked. So as I understand this, this war in Ukraine, it's not the first time Ukraine has been important in world history. It's just the first time that people have noticed how important it might be in world history. So I don't doubt that this will be an axial event. An axial event because, first of all, um, I don't believe, as you've already said, Yvonne, I don't believe that there can be a European security or political architecture without Ukraine taking part. Number two, I believe this will be an axial event for, for, for at a world historical level because of the threat of famine in Africa and Asia, which is associated with this war. And number three, I think this will be an axial event because, and we can return to this, because I believe that the democratic project isn't a matter of technology or fate or economics or any kind of determinism, but that the democratic project is intrinsically about human affirmation of values. And this war is very much a war which depends upon visual va visible values like courage, um, values that are just as real in my view as the rocks in the field. But we in the democratic part of the world have largely given up on seeing democracy that way. So I think if in 2062, you know, probably not me, I'm not planning to live that long, but if, if someone else is, and I don't want to be in the company of the people who do plan to live that long, but if someone is looking back from 2062 onto, thank you for, I think Yuval was the only person who laughed. I completely lost the live audience, but thank you Yuval for being with me here. Um, um, in 2062, looking back, if we're looking back from democracies, I think this will be, an, this will be seen as an axial event because of the affirmation of values. Thank you very much, Eval. This was really challenging. Tim put Ukraine in a place where we normally see Israel. So how will you, <laughs> you see? I can, do, I can do that all day. Mm. Well, um, no, I, I'll start with 1982. 
and how difficult it is to, to see 40 years to the future. I mean, if we had here, as a guest of honor, let's say the chief of staff of NATO from 1982, you have, I don't know, was it Andropov or was it Chernyenko in, 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 in the Kremlin and Afghanistan and solidarity being crushed? Still, still and, Brezhnev was there. In 1982, really? Okay. So, <laughs> and and you, 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 tell, you tell them that our biggest problem right now is that the Russians are invading Donbass and trying to take it from the Ukrainians. He would ask, on which fantasy, which fantasy world are you inhabiting? And it's so difficult to, 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 to see, and it's just 40 years. And the next 40 years are likely to be even more hectic than the previous 40 years because history is accelerating, technology is accelerating. And, and another point is that it's always, I mean, the, the future is not written anywhere. It depends on the decision we make. I completely agree with team that uh, the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a, is a pivotal moment in the history of the 21st century. A lot depends on what happens there, what the Ukrainians are doing, what the Russians are doing, what everybody else around the world is doing with regard to this war. Um, so I, I don't know how people will remember it in 2062 because it depends on the decisions that people are going to take in the next weeks and in the next months. One possibility is that this will be remembered at the moment when the global order finally collapsed. That the order that was built and the institutions that were built for decades to preserve peace, to secure global trade, to prevent famine, to prevent epidemics, this was the moment that it completely collapsed. And the era of chaos and war and poverty began. That's one scenario. Another scenario is that uh, Putin is not allowed to win in Ukraine, that he loses and everybody sees that he is losing, and that it will be a moment when the order was reaffirmed. You know, like you have a social norm and you have a bully comes and breaks it publicly, and everybody is watching to see what will happen. If he gets away with it, the order collapses. But if he's punished, if he loses, the order is actually strengthened, is actually reaffirmed. So I, I don't know what, what's going to, I, I know what I, I hope will happen, but I don't know what will actually happen. It's a moment, I mean, already it seems quite clear that this is a moment when it's, uh, Russia has lost its position as, as a potential superpower. That if on the 23rd of February, a lot of people around the world still thought about Russia as a superpower or a potential superpower, then what, what's been happening in the last few months made it clear that it's not, it can't be. And it's, uh, it, maybe it will become a part of the Chinese camp, maybe it will be a, 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 a puppet of the Chinese, but it's no longer capable of being this kind of superpower that it was in the 20th century and aspired to be in the 21st century. And again, also with regard to Russia, big, a big question is uh, this choice, really, between Europe and the West and China. And one of the things that made it so difficult to believe, I think, that Putin would, would do what, what he did, is that, you know, if you think about it from a rational perspective, there was no threat to Russia coming from the West. Despite all the propaganda and all the paranoia in, in the minds of people like Putin, I mean, see, realistically, nobody in Europe wants to invade Russia. Not the Germans, not the French, nobody. If there is a geopolitical threat to Russia in the 21st century, it comes from the East. It comes from China. And um, the, it, I think that the, the real decision that Putin is facing, and maybe he's already made it, is whether Russia will become a puppet state of China or not. And this could be the moment when Russia became a puppet state of China. And then there is the question of, of the West. And um, I, I think that if Putin have just waited, done nothing, 
just waited for a few years, I don't know, five years, the West would have self-destructed maybe by its internal culture war, which is tearing apart the United States, which is tearing apart much of Europe. Just do nothing and, and, and the West will destroy itself. And by his action, he actually gave the West a chance to, to save itself, to stop the culture war, to remember the key values which Tim was also referring to, to realize that there are much, that, that you know, that these fears that the conservative and liberal camps in the West have of each, of each other, they are as nothing compared to the real danger that the West is facing. Uh, there is still a chance that uh, because of this war, because also of, of other reasons, we could end the culture war in the West. In which case, I think the West has nothing to fear, not from Russia and not from China and not from any other force in the world, because it's still, if it stays united, it's still the most powerful bloc economically, politically, culturally. Um, so we are really at this pivotal moment in, in, world, in, in, in world history from this perspective. And we are also, I think, standing on, on the very edge of the abyss. People think that we've already fallen, but we haven't. But we can fall, what, whatever we saw in the last few years, with the pandemic, with the war, it's nothing compared to what could happen in the next few years if we fall. But we still have a chance to, to, to save ourselves. And, and, and we ho I hope that in 2062, people will look back and say they, they took the right decision. They were staring into the abyss and they stepped back and they saved themselves and they saved us. Yeah, thank you very much. So Tim, are you going to agree with you Val, that in the way uh, Russia or Soviet Union saved the West in the 1945 by fighting on the side of the West, basically now it's going to save the West by fighting against the West. Uh, and from this point of view, this cultural wars that uh, Yuval was referring, to what extent this war is really going to breach also some of the cultural divide, which we see particularly in the United States? To what extent this war can bring the social cohesion, which was so much lacking in our societies in the last years? So I, I remember when I was, I was arguing a few years ago how important Russia was in American domestic politics. And um, people quite rightly pointed out that, well, these things that Russia is able to do in the US, it can only do because of problems that are already native to the United States. I think I would make the same point in response to the idea that Russia is going to rescue the United States. Um, this is quite true that this conflict has become really the only bipartisan issue in America. I've been struck traveling across America how there are Ukrainian flags in places where people would ordinarily not have anything to talk about. So there are Ukrainian flags next to Black Lives Matter banners in some parts of the country, and then there are Ukrainian flags in places where you would not see a Black Lives Matter flag for literally hundreds of miles around. And it has become a subject that allows people, not just in the real world, but also in, on Twitter to talk to one another who weren't talking to each other before. So I agree with you, Val, that there's a kind of chance there, but it's only a beginning. It's only an, it's only an, an, an overture. And for me, like the, the grand question is uh, about getting out of, if you want to call it culture war, is whether you can have a discussion about the future. So it's, it, you can't, the culture war it can't end with a compromise. It's not going to be like, oh, I agree with you this way, have, you're gonna, and you're going to be with me. It's not going to end that way. It agrees, it ends, or it, it, it alters when the subject changes towards the future. And I want to, I wanna, by saying that, I want to affirm or maybe expand a point that you've all made just along the way, which is that this war now is largely about whether political regimes can deal with the future at all. Um, I mean, there are many ways to characterize the regime in Russia, but it, one thing which I find very striking about it, and I've been trying to make this point for a while now, is the way that it consumes the future. 
not just its own future, but everybody else's future, and that it places politics back in um, some kind of version of the past, whether it has to do with some baptism in Kiev a thousand years ago, or more recently with the conquests of Peter the Great, um, it's, it's, it's always going to be a matter of some moment in the past. And this version of politics cannot be allowed to triumph, because in this version of politics, all we have is a dispute about whether or not we were good in the past. And that's not enough. Um, it's not just that it's not enough, it's fundamentally misleading, it's mythical. But we will break out of what you two are calling the culture war when we can have a real discussion about the future. Because you know, I, the, the kind of politics that I see in Russia, where it's all about the past, or really it's about a kind of narcissism, right? Um, in this case, a narcissism of old men, but a narcissism which says, Everything's about the short term. All that matters is Severodonetsk. Let the world burn so long as I can get to the border of Luhansk Oblast, right? That's where Putin stands right now. When I say let the world burn, I mean it quite literally. The United States Supreme Court today um, has granted a hearing to a case which if they, they hear it and they allow it to go through will mean that the United States will become an authoritarian regime where short-sighted people who don't believe in global warming are going to be in charge. This all for me hangs together. The, the same people who bring you the war in Ukraine are the people who don't believe that we're gonna ever deal with climate change. So this whole authoritarian turn for me is, is about the past as myth, but also about consuming the future. And that's not just Russia challenging us, that's something that we, we have in Israel. It's something that we have in the United States. It's something that we have in the West in general. That's like, that's a tendency which we're gonna have to deal with our, ourselves. So um, that for me is the big question. Like, and, and it's part of the answer to the first question too. Can we break out of this into a future where we actually deal with climate change and where we're, we have a horizon of time in front of us instead of just, a, in, instead of just a, a terrible present and a mythical past, right? One of the advisors to, to, to Zelensky, I think it was Podolyak, tweeted a few weeks ago, like, we should be talking about climate change and artificial intelligence and all the things that you've all and I would like to talk about, but instead we're talking about famine and you know and we're talking about it because of this war right so for me this war is just an extreme example of a general problem which is how do we break into a politics where we can actually talk together about different versions of the future uh, listen this is great and this is really to push you to the future because what strikes me is that if you see the streets of europe or america the two groups that can mobilize people to go on the streets are based on the fear of the future. It could be the climate people tomorrow, uh, Fridays for tomorrow, who basically said, if we're not going to do anything now, they're not going to be worse. And the other is people very much driven by the demographic fears. If we're not going to stop migrants now, we're not going to be around here. And for me, this is a big change that came. For me, modernity always was how to live without fearing the future. And suddenly now, from all these different points of view, future is perceived like a threat. And here, Yuval, particularly on technology and others, you're much more optimistic about the future than many. In a certain way, you didn't sure. look I mean, as scared. You didn't look so scared about the future. So I'm interested how you see future in a world in which fearing of the future is what gives political identities of groups, of parties, of countries, of what basically uh, Tim was saying. Yeah, but I, I completely agree with Tim on this, that this is, this is actually a step forward when people are afraid of the future and talking about their fears. Because, you know, when, like, I look at myself like seven, eight, eight years ago, and I had the feeling that, okay, all these issues, like war and famine, this, this, is, this is the past. Humanity has learned its lessons. It knows how to deal with these things. They can still erupt. I mean, the laws of nature didn't change. But we understand the danger and we have managed to build institutions that are able to deal with it. And that the big question now are the, the new dangers on the horizon, whether it's the ecological dangers, whether it's the technological dangers, like how to manage the explosive power of artificial intelligence and bioengineering. And um, I'm, in, in the last few years, it, 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 it just turned out to be completely wrong that we have to go back 
it's, you know, it's like feeling this deja vu that you have to go back to school and learn the same lessons and do the same texts over and over again. And you, you, you listen, for instance, to, 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 to Putin talk to the declaration of war on the 24th of February and to Russian television, and they are talking about Nazis. And as a historian, I just find it kind of completely incomprehensible. What are they talking about? I mean, they should just look at their calendar. They don't have clocks in Russia. I mean, they don't know it's 2012. What Nazis? What are they talking about? Is it 1942 now? And it's, yes, in the minds of too many people, it's 1942. And I, I, I have the same people also in my country and in my region that they are suffering for, you know, this too much history. And I remember reading Tim's book and also Masha Gessen's uh, 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 research on, on Russia and on this kind of obsession with the past. And this idea that, you know, I mean, the, the, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Communist Revolution, it begins with this tremendous vision of the future. Forget about the past. We are just going to talk about the future, the future. And until some point in the 1950s, 60s, they felt that the future belongs to them. The future belongs to socialism. And then things started to slow down and fall apart, and the future escaped them. And then what they did is the only thing left was the past. And you saw kind of Russian Soviet propaganda switching from talking about the glorious future to talking about the glorious past, the Second World War how we defeated the Nazis, how we beat the Nazis. And, you know, if for decades you tell people that the best time ever, the greatest moment ever, was when we fought the Nazis, eventually people just want to recreate it. Oh, if, if it was so great, then let's do it again. And um, as a historian, I just find it, I, I know that this is how people work sometimes. But I find it so depressing and so incomprehensible and really kind of, I don't know, ashamed of my own profession. I know that it's, it's mostly not professional historians who are to blame for it. It's kind of politicians and leaders who hijack history for their own purposes. But, but, but still, there is a kind of almost personal shame that uh, something that I loved so much, the, the study of history, if maybe if we can just, you know, <laughs> Make people forget about history for, for a while. Just press a button. And also in my country, we suffer from too much history. I, I, I hope that we manage to reach a point when, yes, we have these arguments between the people who are afraid of the future, the people who are afraid of the demographic danger or the ecological danger. At least they are talking about the future and not being stuck in some eternal past. Uh, thank you very much. By the way, in this institute, uh, Tony Judd started writing his famous history of Europe after 1945 called the post-war. And I'm asking this because when you mentioned the Nazi discourse, for somebody who is not a historian, unlike you, I'm not a historian, what I see is just striking. On one level, you see President Putin saying that he is basically invading Ukraine in order to denazify it. The rest of the world basically start to see Putin very much in terms of it was seeing Hitler going to Ukraine in 1940s. And in this conflict, Israel is one of the mediators. So what is happening to the intellectual infrastructure on which post-war Europe was based? So in a certain way, we are re-enacting past in the way that past is becoming totally meaningless. Is that to me? Yeah, it's to yeah. you. <laughs> I mean, this is, so when I think of the European trajectory and also the Israeli and the American, um, we depend a great deal on the Second World War. And that's one of the reasons why this war in Ukraine is, is stretching our moral resources. Because as I understand the quote unquote denazification effort, one of its goals is precisely to unmoor us whether we are Israeli or American or East or West European, to unmoor us from a set of references that have in fact been important. I mean, insofar as there has been a common moral discourse, and this was actually the epilogue to Tony Judd's book, Post-War, insofar as there has been a kind of emerging consensual discourse about morality in, you know, in, in the West, let's call it, it has had a lot to do with the Holocaust one way or another. And 
in attacking Ukraine again, because let's remember that the Second World War itself was largely about Ukraine, in attacking Ukraine again at a time when it has a Jewish president and is a democracy and saying that this is denazification, what Putin is doing is not just perverse, I think it's deliberately meant to unmoor us. It's meant to, it's meant like so much of what he does, it's meant to leave us with nothing to hold on to, to, to confuse us. And, and this is, you know, obviously without, with, and this is another reason why the war is important to emphasize Yuval's point, because I think Europeans and not only will have to be able to, to, to extract some kind of moral lessons from this war that will matter, if not 80, let's say 40 years down, down the line. Um, it strikes me returning to, you know, returning to this question of the future that, that this, what, this, what you're talking about is a kind of political technology which gets us, which, hope, which separates us from both the past and the future, right? Because these, these quote unquote Nazis are mythical creatures. They're not to be found in the past, the present, or, or the future. And I think, I mean, I would, maybe it's just a disagreement about terminology of all, but I think we need history precisely because history tells us that we weren't always right. Whereas myth always tells us that we were right. You know, so the Russian story about 1942 is that we were right. Just like the American story about 1942 is that we were right. It's always about how we were right. Whereas history is always about how it was more complicated and you have to see lots of different points of view and maybe we can see some patterns and so on. But national myth, political memory, is always about how we were the victims and always about how, how we were right. And so I tend to think that in getting to the future, we ha we need the past like there's a, you, it's like the past is a thing you stand on in order to get to the future but that the thing that we're talking about this kind of myth that it's like a trap door you can't stand on that you can't stand on an idea about how your people you know whether they're white people or russians or whatever your group is that they were always right that's a trap door you know then you fall into into a black hole that you never get out of it and i think the way this hooks up to tech is that this kind of political narcissism is reinforced by technology. Where, where, where things took a strange turn, and I'm not the first person to observe this, but where things took a strange turn in the late 20th and early 21st century is when high tech started to be directed chiefly towards the mind and not chiefly towards the world. We thought high tech was going to make us smarter and better able to deal with the outside world. Instead, you know, with all, with all apologies and provisos where they belong, it's generally made us stupider and less capable of dealing with the outside world. So that we're now in this ironic position where we're facing climate change, which is par excellence, a technical question having to do with the three dimensions of the outside world, which frankly, we should be able to hammer. We should be able to crush that problem. We should be done with that problem. Technologically, we should be able to do this, but we can't largely because we're held back by various kinds of political narcissism. As a technical problem, we should be able to deal with it, but we can't because of not for non-technical reasons. And that, I think this is connected to the to the political narcissism which keeps us out of the future, but also to this turn that tech took where, you know, growing up, going back to 1982, if you were in 1982, when you thought of high tech, you were thinking of something which could alter the world, right? And what I remember in the early 80s talking about climate change because people in fact did know about it in the early 1980s. As a high school debater, I talked about it. And the consensus then was, oh, we'll be able to deal with this technologically. And I think that consensus was right. It's just that we have messed things up. We have, our, our own tech has helped us to move towards this world where we can't face the future and we can't deal with it. Even though the problem, and this is like, if we go under as a species, this will be one of the many painful ironies that nobody will be left around to appreciate. If we go under because of climate change, we will be failing to address a problem in the three-dimensional world, which we should have been able to address technologically. Talking about technologically, about why uh, basically the cover pages of uh, most newspapers have been covering Ukraine, uh, New York Times right, uh, uh, ran a very long article about the level of technological surveillance in China. And for somebody like me who is not particularly interested in technology, it was really shocking. Uh, the only good story about the big date authoritarianism is that you do not need the police informers anymore. 
because everybody is informing on himself. Uh, so, but you have a level of social controls coming from technologies that is really changing the world. And you are more skeptical, uh, basically, than Tim. To what extent our classical understanding of liberal democracy can deal with this? Uh, in your 21 uh, uh, lessons, you made a point, which in my view is a very important point. Now when we're fighting and trying to resist attacks on liberal democracy, is it really possible for liberal democracy to preserve itself and basically its own understanding of freedom in a world which is so much dominated by artificial intelligence technology and where the level of surveillance is nothing compared to even the worst kind of a dreams of the 20th century? No, I think it, it connects to what Tim just said about the way the technology, which we thought was mainly about controlling the world outside, is increasingly directed towards our minds, towards the world inside us, which presents a completely different challenge to liberal democracy. We are used to uh, uh, threats to, in, to individuals, to citizens, to freedoms coming from Putin, from Hitler, from Stalin, from these big state apparatus, from secret police agents coming from outside. And you have this kind of individual mind or individual soul and with its free will and, and inner autonomy, which kind of struggles to keep some space of freedom. But what, what is always kind of working in favor of the liberal ideals of individual freedom is that they can't really get inside you. It's always from the outside, and there is a certain point they can't penetrate further inside. So you have the heroic individual who is trying to create this, even in the totalitarian regime, <clears throat> this limited space of personal freedom. And what's happening now with technology is that uh, uh, um, the defenses are all down. And we are still not there. We haven't seen anything yet in this term. But the technology, especially in places like China, is developing <clears throat> to go very deep inside. And the turning point is when an external system can understand you better than you understand yourself. That's the turning point. It doesn't need to understand you perfectly. There is no such thing as perfect understanding in the world, but it doesn't have to. It's just that there is outside a system which knows my desires, my fears, my hopes, my dreams, my, better than I know them. Now, in a way, this was a dream of dictators and totalitarian regimes throughout history, but they, never, they were never able to actually accomplish this. Even if you have a KGB agent following you around 24 hours a day, they still don't really know what's happening inside you. And technically, you can't have a KGB agent following every Soviet citizen around 24 hours a day because you don't have 200 million KGB agents. It's impossible. Now it is becoming possible. It's possible for the first time in history to follow everybody all the time. And it's possible, it is becoming possible to go under the skin. It's not just seeing where you go, who you meet, what you say. It's actually understanding what you feel and what you think and understanding this better than you understand yourself. And that, that's my biggest fear, because, you know, in the end, liberal democracy as we have known it in the last two or three centuries, it has been based on, I would say, some kind of misunderstanding of human nature. Humans don't have a unified, solid self inside them. There is a small universe inside us. But still, the myth of the unified, solid self as the individual, as the citizen, as the customer, as the basis for free markets and free democracies, because nobody 
could really get inside and get to, 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 to kind of dissect it, it was okay for practical reason to believe in this myth. But it's now falling apart. What happens when somebody out there, a system, can understand what's happening inside me better than I understand it, and can therefore also manipulate me in ways that were unthinkable before? I think this is the biggest long-term challenge to liberal democracies. I would very much have liked to focus, for instance, in my own writings, in my own public discussions on this. And I thought that this is what I will be focusing on, say, five years ago, six years ago. But unfortunately, now we have to postpone it. First of all, we need to again deal with the old 20th century problems, which Putin represents, before we, and, 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 and the, 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 the terrible thing is that the technology is not waiting for us. In places like China, they are developing the technology to, to, to realize this kind of, of, of hyper-totalitarian control. And it's, we will have to deal with that too. Thank you very much. So you made a point which is very interesting in touching on something on which Tim has been writing. So you said in a classical liberal age, we believe that there is individual with a core. It did not exist, but we also knew that it's unpredictable. Now we know that it's no individual, but it is predictable, the behavior of this no individual. So, but Tim was touching in his writing on something that I find quite important, particularly in these digital conversations, where not simply that you don't know the individual on the other side, you don't know to whom you're talking, to your bot or to your person. And for a liberal, this is the nightmare, to talk to something that cannot change its mind. Because what it means to govern by persuasion, if on the other side is something that is not changing your mind. And Tim, I always believe that this is one of the important things in your latest writing, where the idea of technology and traditional liberal understanding of freedom were very much exposed the problem that we are facing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's an idea. I mean, that's an idea that you phrased for me, Yvonne, when you referred to it as the fanatic, which is, now I'm, which is how I'm now writing about it. It goes to what is best in us. So this has been a largely pessimistic conversation, but our capa the, the, there's another way of phrasing this, which is that there have been pluralistic, rule of law, prosperous, democratic societies. How on earth were they possible, right? How is that possible? And we may not know the answer to the how, but the what is beyond question. I mean, they're flawed in all kinds of ways, and I can join the criticism too, but I think it is legitimate to put the question the other way, whether we're talking about 1982 or about 2062 or 2022, and ask, how is it possible at all? How is it possible to have these decent societies given the absence of the integral self? Um, given, the, given the fact that I agree with you, that our whole tradition, at least our, our Anglo-Saxon and I think German traditions of thinking about the, the individual are wrong, <laughs> how, how is it that we've managed to have these societies? How, how are they possible? And so the way I'm gonna phrase my answer to your question is that you can think of the digital world as abusing the best in us. That you know, when we go into a contact with bots or on Facebook with unknown interlocutors, th what's good about us is that we accommodate. That's good. Like It's good that we read what the other person or non-person wrote and in some way aim for the middle. The problem is that when there's not another person, when it's just a set of algorithms defined to exploit us in some way or another, our capacity for accommodating the other, which is a good thing about us, right, gets, gets exploited and we get worn out and we lose the capacity and it turns against us and we ourselves become predictable, which is, which is the key word for me now, as I try in this, in this book that Yvonne is nice enough to refer to, which I haven't actually finished about freedom, um, I'm trying to rethink our tradition because I agree with you all. I mean, I, I don't think we can base an argument about liberalism on a defunct and never, and never very satisfying portrait of the way the, the, the mind works. And I think, I, I think the key, I think the defense of the defense of our kind of society, which is based upon rationality, has not really worked very well. 
and the, the schools of thought and the, the title pages of books which have rationality have not for me been very convincing so far. And I think there's a reason for that. And that is that I don't think rationality is actually what makes us who we are or what enables the kind of society we're talking about. Um, what I think enables the kind of society we're talking about is rather unpredictability. I think that is what makes us different from the machines. But what the machines and the algorithms do successfully is they work from behaviorist premises to make us more predictable, right? To predictify us, to make us more predictable. And that, if, and that would suggest that the thing, the thing which is inside us, which is being corrupted or addressed, the thing which is under our skin, to use Yuval's phrasing, isn't a rational actor, but instead certain unpredictable impulses, which returns me to values. Because insofar as we are creatures of the th three-dimensional physical world, we are predictable down to a certain level, down to the quantum level, let's say. But insofar as we are creatures who operate in a world of values, where the values are real but incommensurate and we're constantly making decisions among them and all those decisions will be different, though, then we are unpredictable beings. And so this, you know, looping back around to what I was saying before, this is why I think individualism and democracy depend less on rationality and more on unpredictability, which actually brings us back to this institute. Um, it, was, it was Václav Havel's 1979 um, uh, essay, The Power of the Powerless, which made, to my mind, a very powerful argument about technology, which is that technology will force us into our most probable states. That's Havel's phrase. Of course, that's pre-internet, pre-everything. But that, I found, at the time when I read that for the first time in the 80s, I didn't know what he was talking about. And now I think I do know what he's talking about. Because that's being forced into your most probable state is when you can be predicted by machines and by other people. And when you can be predicted, then you can be ruled. If you can be predicted, you can be ruled. Um, you can be ruled over. And the, per and the person to whom that essay was dedicated, the power of the powerless was dedicated, was a Czech philosopher recently deceased after secret police interrogation, a man called Jan Patochka. Um, and this institute began precisely after Patochka died and his papers were smuggled out of what was then communist Czechoslovakia here um, by Klaus Nellen, who along with Cornelia Klinger and Krzysztof Michalski was one, of, was one of the founders of this place. And that's just by way of saying that Often in the, in the past, whether it's the last 40 years or even further back, there are arguments and traditions which can help us deal with the, with the technological problems of the present, right? That that's, that's also there for us. This is because we are going to, uh, to the last part of our conversation. But Yuval, because you have been thinking really a lot about technology. And here's the story that I was uh, always struck by. If the war is around, and by the way, President Putin said that who is going to control artificial intelligence is going to run the world. How we are living in a moment in which everything that is good about us, everything that basically was connecting us, has been totally weaponized. Because this is the major tragedy of Europe. When the Germans have been buying Russian gas, they were believing that they are building peace. And suddenly, this is becoming a weapon of war. So I'm very much interested how you can have an ethical dimension about what we are doing with technologies when we think about others in terms of war. No, I think it should be very, very clear that technology is not deterministic. It is subject to political choices and to ethical choices. One of the biggest dangers, and it goes back to this discussion we had about the future, is to think that you have no decisions to make about the future. Because a certain kind of technology is developing, it's inevitable that this technology will develop, and once it's here, it will dictate a certain future. So there is nothing we can choose. And this kind of thinking, you find it also in, in, in places like Silicon Valley, because it's convenient to have this kind of technological determinism, then you don't have responsibility. It's not me. It's just the inevitable march of technology and history. And this is completely false. You can always have choices about technology. You can use a knife to murder somebody. 
to save their life in surgery, or to make salad for dinner. It's your choice, not the knives. You look at the 20th century, people use the same technology to build totalitarian dictatorships and to build democratic, liberal uh, societies. West Germany and East Germany were basically built with the same technology. And it's also the same now. And um, if you think about surveillance technology, it can be used to create the most totalitarian regimes that ever existed, things far more uh, totalitarian, far more intrusive, even than the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. But the same technology can, can also be reversed and enable citizens to better monitor governments and corporations, to, see, to, 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 to prevent corruption, to see if they pay their taxes and, and so forth. It's the same technology. It's also surveillance. Somebody is choosing to uh, uh, design a technology to follow me instead of a technology that enables me to monitor the government. That's a decision. It's not the technology's decision. So I think there are several guidelines that we should have, that if we keep them, technology will enable us to create better societies and not worse. One very cl clear principle with regard to these surveillance technologies is that if you collect information on me, this information should be used to help me and not to manipulate me. And this is a very old principle. We expect this from doctors, from lawyers. If my personal physician has a lot of very private information about me, that's okay because she's using it to help me. If she now goes and sells it to a third party, to a political party to manipulate me, that's wrong. We know this about doctors for centuries. Why not apply it to the big corporations? Another principle is that whenever you increase surveillance of individuals, you must simultaneously increase surveillance of the government and corporations. Then you have this kind of, of balance, and then it it's, it's, uh, uh, preserves the democratic system. A third principle is that um, you should never allow all the information to be concentrated in one place whether a corporation or a government, this is the high road to totalitarianism. So have separate databases. The medical database should not be merged with the police database. It should be a very clear principle. And the most important principle, I think, that technology should always take into account the human ability to change and even encourage the human ability to change, which is the opposite of what is often happen, happening because of exactly what Tim pointed out, that, you know, it's all about predicting people, but it's not about discovering the truth about us. It's about making us predictable. Right. When humans change, it's a big problem for the system because it, if, if it tries to sell us something, whether it's a product or a politician or a war, and we constantly change, then it doesn't know how to sell it. So it has a built-in interest to make us stop changing. And I think a very fundamental principle of any technology we develop is that this technology, first of all, acknowledges that humans are capable of changing and enables it instead of blocking it. And this goes back thousands and thousands of years, you know, to the first bureaucratic and religious systems, that things like caste, like race, they were used as categories to prevent human change. You are born into a caste of peasants, you will be a peasant. It's easier to control society when things are so predictable. And the same way that we look back at the idea of caste and say, this is terrible. You can't just, you know, I mean, it was, it was accurate. It predicted accurately. If you were born to a peasant family, you really were going to be a peasant. But not because this is, was the only thing you can do, it's because the system confined you. So we are facing now the same type of problems on a, on a much more complicated and larger scale, but the principle should be very obvious that the technology should always leave room for human change and not restrict the ability of humans to change.
Thank you. And in, Tim, what is going to be your personal advice to all of us as individuals, how to preserve our unpredictability? Hey, there's a meta question there, which is that if you're going to believe in values, you have to believe in values. So what, what's, what's predictable about the world is also predictable about us. If I drop someone in the audience here from the top of the building, their body will perform just like any other body. It'll, in that sense, we're part of the physical world. But what they think, this is not the happiest example, but I'm trapped in it. But what they think and feel on the way down will be particular to them. Right? And what is true about dying is also true about living, um, as Heidegger might have said, that you know, we, we, what's different about us as we make our way through life is not that we're, we're separate from the, 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 the laws of physics, or the regularities of physics, we're not. What's different about us is that we can appreciate them, get them inside ourselves and manipulate them and try to change the world on the basis of how much we understand the world. Right? So that's an old fashioned enlightenment argument that you, you, you are able to enforce values on the world insofar as you understand the world. So you can have, you can have a pro-scientific view which says that insofar as you understand the three-dimensional world, then you can apply values to it. And the, the value application is always going to be the unpredictable part, but you're not going to succeed in applying those values if you don't care about the science part of the world. Um, and then in terms of practical recommendations, and this again is an East European argument from the 70s, you can't do it alone. You can't be unpredictable on your own. It's really difficult. If you're that last person standing in front of the tank, you're, you know, that's wonderful, but you're not, you're not, that's not the position you want to be in. In order for there to be lots of unpredictable people, we have to support each other, which means we have to think in terms of, as you've all already said, we have to have a technological architecture which urges us to or at least allows us to change but we also have to have institutions that enable human change and just to name something which we have been dancing around but haven't really mentioned we have to have less inequality of wealth because inequality of wealth slows down social mobility and social mobility is one of the major ways that in the course of a life you become unpredictable by not being a peasant just because your parents were peasants and another, another, and this is a very basic thing, but another, an, another point here about unpredictability is that in order to be unpredictable, we have to have facts. Because facts are not stale and dry. Facts are precisely the things that are uncomfortable, whether they're historical facts or whether they're facts about the present. Facts are uncomfortable. Myths, narcissism, all very comfortable. Facts are uncomfortable, and you can't generate all the facts about the world that you need by yourself, only institutions can do that. And by institutions, I mean very simple things like humanities departments in universities, but first and foremost, and above all, investigative journalists. The examples that you've all just gave, um, for example, the Panama Papers, right? The Panama Papers, or for that matter, the war in Ukraine. We know so much about the war in Ukraine because there are 5,000 journalists working in Ukraine. You have to have the humans backed by the institutions to help us all be in, be, to be uh, based in fact and therefore unpredictable. And the most important institution for me, and one, gets one that gets overlooked and one that's in a lot of trouble and one that, by the way, we try to support here at our institute is that of the investigative journalist. We talk all the time about the facts and we pay basically no money to the people whose job it is to produce the facts for us. So one bit of advice to everyone who wants to be unpredictable is support the institutions that make, it, that, make that possible. Thank you very much. I should confess, concluding that it, what happened in the last one hour was quite predictable. When you have two interesting people, it is a great conversation. So Yuval, I will be very happy to see you in this building and in this library. Mm -hmm. So feel welcome to the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna and be sure we are going to be around at least for the next 40 years. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Yuval. Thank you. Thank you.